Hi, welcome to my mini lecture on black holes. In today's discussion, I'll be talking to you about what exactly a black hole is, and then in the second half, I'll talk to you about some of the evidence that astronomers have that they're real. Let's get started. We'll begin by just talking to you about general relativity very briefly. General relativity is just the modern theory of gravity. It's the idea that when you put a massive object in space, the mass of that object causes space-time to curve. This is summed up in a famous quote from physicist John Wheeler, mass tells space-time how to curve, and space-time tells mass how to move. General relativity does a really good job across a wide variety of topics. In what we call the weak field limit, when the force of gravity is low, when objects are traveling slowly, general relativity basically reduces to Newton's theory of gravity. So it has predictions that are very, very similar to Newton's. In some cases, even in that weak field limit, general relativity has important corrections to what we could figure out based only on Newton. For example, GPS satellites rely on general relativity corrections without which GPS wouldn't function because it relies on incredibly precise timing measurements. However, if you get into really extreme environments when the speeds of objects are very, very fast or when the density of matter is very, very high and therefore gravity becomes strong, general relativity produces dramatically different outcomes than you would expect based on Sir Isaac Newton. The two most commonly known scenarios that involve strong general relativity are black holes and the Big Bang. Today we'll be talking about the first of those. So what exactly is a black hole? Black holes are very different from the types of objects that we've talked about up to this point. In fact, they're not really objects in the traditional sense at all. When we talked about stars, or stellar remnants like white dwarfs, or planets, or even like a stellar nebula, it's made of matter, and that matter has a well-defined structure that we can see. A black hole, on the other hand, is really just a region of space, and it's a highly unusual region of space because someone, somewhere, has packed an incredible amount of matter into a very, very tiny volume leading to extremely high density and therefore extremely powerful gravity close to that matter. If you get close enough, the escape velocity exceeds the speed of light, which means that even light will not be able to escape from the gravity of the black hole. If you remember, the escape velocity is just the speed that you need in order to leave a location and go off and not come back. So if I were standing on the surface of the Earth and I threw a baseball at the Earth's escape velocity, that baseball would leave Earth's atmosphere, go out into space, and just keep going and never return to the Earth. That escape velocity gets faster and faster as the strength of gravity gets higher and higher, and eventually that escape velocity will equal the speed of light. And when it does, that's when we get a black hole. It's important to remember, therefore, that despite what you see in some very bad science fiction, black holes don't suck. Black holes exert gravity just like everything else. If you were to take the sun and replace it with a black hole of exactly the same mass, Earth would get very dark but would not otherwise change. The orbit of the Earth would remain exactly the same. The Earth would not begin to fall towards the black hole. The solar system would not collapse. None of that is true. This thing that we talk about when we call it a black hole, this region of space, has some important features. Um, the first is its outer boundary, what we call its event horizon. For a common garden variety black hole, the event horizon is described by something that we call the Schwarzschild radius. That radius depends on mass. As you pack more and more mass into a black hole, 
its Schwarzschild radius gets bigger and bigger, and so the event horizon encompasses a larger and larger volume of space. To illustrate what the event horizon does, consider the example on the slide. That black circle represents the edge of the black hole. So imagine that NASA, because it had an enormous budget, sent a spaceship with a bunch of astronauts inside to a nearby black hole because they wanted to study it. So the instruments inside the spacecraft, they map out the black hole, and they say, cool, let's send some data back to NASA. So they point a laser beam back towards Earth, and they turn the laser on, and the laser carries all of the astronauts' recorded data back towards NASA. So far, so good. But then, the spaceship's commander has a really, really bad idea. And convinces the crew that since they're all there, they should take the time to look at the black hole from the inside. So the spaceship goes inside the black hole's event horizon, they collect a bunch of data, and they try and send it off to NASA in that red laser beam again. But now, instead of just going off towards NASA, that red laser beam starts making its way toward the event horizon, but it doesn't make it past. It falls back and eventually spirals of the black hole. Inside of that, so closer to the middle of the black hole, nothing, not even light, can escape. Whereas outside the event horizon, there's some hope that, say, a laser beam might manage to make it off and not fall back towards the black hole. This is a very cartoonish picture. If we talk about real general relativity, there's a lot more subtlety and complexity to it than this, but it gives you a general picture for what's going on. The black hole, as originally proposed in the 1920s, is really just a region of space whose gravity is very, very deep. We can think of gravity as a sort of well that you have to climb out of if you want to escape from the gravity of that object. Well, the well of a black hole has sides that are so steep that even a beam of light, if it starts going up from the bottom, never makes it to free space before it falls back down. We can make these by crushing a huge amount of mass into a very, very tiny volume. And the size of that volume is set by that Schwarzschild radius that I mentioned earlier. Most of the black holes in the universe come from collapsing massive stars. We've talked about how massive stars and their lives if you have more than about eight times the mass of the sun in your star, that star is going to experience a core collapse supernova. When that happens, normally the thing that gets left behind is what we call a neutron star. But sometimes, if the parent star is in just the right mass range, that neutron star will start pulling in some more matter and it'll cross a mass threshold. We don't know exactly what the mass threshold is, probably somewhere around two to three times the mass of the sun. And when it does, that neutron star can no longer support it, it support itself against its own weight, and it collapses. And this time, there's nothing to stop that collapse, so all of the mass in that neutron star falls down to a single point that becomes the singularity of the black hole, and a new black hole is born. Black holes do some really amazing things to space and time when you get close to them. Because gravity bends space-time, black holes alter not only the fabric of space around it, but also the fabric of time itself, which means that as you get close to a black hole, time actually seems to slow down. That's illustrated on the panel on the bottom of the slide, and you can see that for the Viking spacecraft, which is very, very far from our sun, and therefore less influenced by the sun's gravity than the Earth is, more time has passed than for a clock that's close to the sun. And the same thing will happen for black holes, but on steroids. We can also get really dramatic stretching of objects as they get close to a black hole, and we call this by a name 
which is really, really fun. This is one of my favorite things about black holes. We call this stretching spaghettification. So imagine if on our previous example, the crew on that spaceship had mutinied against the commander and then said, no, we're not going inside a black hole, you're nuts, and they threw the commander out of, this, um, out of the spaceship towards the black hole. So as the commander starts falling towards the black hole, her feet are going to be closer to the black hole than her head will be. So they're going to experience just a little bit more gravity down here than up here. And the result of that is gravitational tides. So the commander gets stretched out along a line towards the black hole, pulled out into a long, thin strand called spaghettification. That's where the name comes from. So we've talked about what a black hole is. It's a region of space. It's not a solid object the way a, say, a neutron star or a white dwarf is. And it's a region of space whose gravity is so strong that not even light can escape. And if you went and you visited a black hole, you would not be sucked in, but you would experience some really bizarre effects, including dilation of time, so that time slows down for somebody near the black hole, compared to that experienced by someone far away. And you can see an example of this in the film Interstellar. In part two of this video, I'll be talking to you about the evidence we have that black holes are real. There's a link to the next part somewhere, maybe around here. And I encourage you, um, if you have a moment, to go and watch that too, because some of this evidence is really, really cool.